Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Chester House Hemp uh, Song Fest. I'd like to tell you about Chester House Hemp 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 H
I like to give credits like that because in the theater, I've been in the theater almost, yeah, this is my 50th year in the theater. And if you do a show and, and they don't put your name on, you raise all kind of care, you see? So I want, I want to give these people credit. They all have a lot to contribute tonight. And uh, before we start, I want to thank the, the three teachers who prepared this wonderful group. From Kennedy High School is Brother James Bontrager. Stand up. Sir. That's, that's his claque there. <laughs> From Lincoln High, Steve Kramer. my credit list.
two two days, just two days of working with these young people. They've done a marvelous job of being able to throw themselves into this type of culture in such a little time when they've had such little exposure to the people who created this type of song. They've done a wonderful job. I'm proud of them. Now we have a... Uh, Thank you for being proud of them also. We have a song here now, Christmas song, Mary Boy Child. I'm sure some of you must have heard this for, ye for years without knowing that it was my song. Every time you hear this on the television or radio, I go to the bank. <laughs> years ago, I, I wrote the, uh, the lyrics, uh, well, no, not the lyrics, the melody to this little song, Back in 1930, back in New York, I was living with a, a friend, a doctor in New York from the West Indian Islands. And, that, and that's where I picked up the West Indian dialects. I used to run on ships when I was going to school in Boston, ships that run from Boston to New York as a waiter in the summertime. And most of the waiters on there came from various West Indian Islands. So I made friends with all of them and picked up all the dialects. And some of the best jobs I've had in radio in, in Hollywood have been because I could speak with a foreign accent, a Cuban accent. And so uh, you heard me on some job. You didn't know who it was. I was speaking as a Cuban. And so this, this, little, this little song, I, we had a, a birthday party for my friend Seeley, all West Indians, and I decided to make a little song and use the different foods that we have in the West Indies, just as you have as Norwegians and Danes and Swedes. You have various foods that you brought from the other old country, and you're still eating them over here as Americans, you see. And so the West Indians do the same thing. They have all kinds of foods in each other. So I put these different foods together in a song, and it went like this. They call everything that's a liquid in the West Indies, it's called a tea, a lemon tea, coffee tea, milk tea. If it's a liquid, it's a tea. So this song is called He Pawn and Chocolate Tea. Pawn, you know, cake, cake like a cone pone. And it said this. Him don't care much about okra soup. No hopping John for he. A but child of him sure I'm crazy about. He pawn and chocolate tea. My, my, my. The man he sure I'm crazy about. He pawn and chocolate tea. Uh, me take some pong, me take some edders and sea eggs and cook so nice for he. Him take one look, turn up he knows. I'm drinking chocolate tea and so forth. Twenty years later. <laughs> Twenty-five years later, I'm in Hollywood and working with the, the late Walter Schumann. Some of you know that name. He had the fine Esquire in Hollywood, professional. And he was my publisher and friend. He said, Jester, you have to write a new Christmas song. I said, well, I've got, we've got three. He said, write another one. Our, 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 our competition is catching up with us. So I went into my trance and came out with this same melody that I had written 25 years ago and put these words to it that you hear now. Our soloist for Mary's Little Boy Child is Joe Monsieur. Bethlehem that night. They find no place to born she child. Not a single room was in sight. Bye. 
find a little nook in a stable all forlorn. And in that manger, cold and dark, very little boy shall he born. Now the three wise men, they tell old King Herod, we hear a new king born today. We bring him frankincense and myrrh, we come from far away. Herod, when him learned this news, him mad as he can be. He tells you, wise men, find this child so that I may worship he. Long time ago in the Bethlehem, so the Holy Bible says. Mary, poor child, Jesus Christ, he born on Christmas Day. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, gee whiz. Okay. <laughs> we have. Uh, our last song in this group is a song called In That Great Getting Up Morning. I want to give you a little bit of information uh, before because I'm running right on time. And I'll let you out of here in, in one hour. I think so. Yes, that's right. I'll let you out in an hour. But I'd like, to have, I'd like you to have as much information of this culture since this is uh, uh, black culture as possible. How many of you saw The Roots? The, the television play Roots. Quite a number of you. Yes, oh yes, that's good. In there you saw a scene. There was a scene where a young man and a young woman were, were married and they jumped over a broom. You remember that scene? They jumped over this broom. How many of you know the significance of, of, a, of that type of marriage? Don't see any hands now. Don't see any hands. Well, I tell you, that was an American tradition, not black. We didn't bring it from Africa because we were what you call pagans and infidels. You all brought that here. And so, so I want to tell you about it. My grandmother was a slave in Virginia over there. And when I grew up as a child, I grew up listening to slaves tell their stories of what happened on their plantation. In the summertime, balmy evening, she, she attracted a lot of friends, all of her friends, sometimes 17 or 18 of them, 18 would be sitting out there in the backyard, and they were all ex-slaves, men and women, and they used to tell the different things that happened on their plantation, and every one of them was married by that same method of, of jumping over a broomstick. And, uh, so I grew up with it, and here 20, about 20 years ago, I bought a new encyclo set of the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, and that time they used to send you a block of stamps. And, and uh, let's see if I can take this off. I have uh, arthritis very badly in, in this hip, and I'm going to uh, get a new hip if I could ever get enough time to, to get one put in. So in the meantime, I have to sit down a little bit. Don't feel sorry for me. We're going to go right on and give you a good show. But I do have to sit down now, every now and then. So uh, 
I bought this Encyclopedia Britannica, and they sent you a stamp, a, a block of stamps, and if you're in, in research, uh, as I am, and, and uh, couldn't find the answer to your problem in your own library, you could send it to Chicago. They had a research library there, and they would look up your, your question and send it to you free of charge. And so I kept them busy for years and years, as long as the stamps lasted. I, I got a lot of research done uh, sending stamps to Chicago. And so I wrote to them 20, over 20 years ago and said, now my grandmother was married by a method called jumping over the broom. I do not believe it was African. We didn't bring it over here. Who brought that to, to America and where, where did it come from? Took them six months. And they, they finally sent me a whole block of information. And uh, it, was, it was thought of the uh, first thing, they jumped over the room. Oh, it was done in Yugoslavia, in England, in Scotland, in Ireland, in Spain. In Spain, they used to do not only jump over the broom, but uh, they had a, a big pedestal here, and they would put an earthen jar on this pedestal, and then the boy and the girl would, would take the broom simultaneously. They both take this broom, and they would break, break this, try to break. If they broke this earthen jar off the pedestal, then that was the marriage. They were married. That's Spanish. And then in the United States here, they, they thought that the broomstick was sacred because it came from the tree on which Jesus Christ was crucified. Now that was the superstition. Then I found a book later in Hollywood, a book almost this thick of nothing but the superstition of brooms in the United States. Superstition of a broomstick in the United States, both black and white. Poor blacks and poor whites, of course, but, uh, but, but, but uh, of blacks and whites. So now, here's what they did. They thought that because this broomstick was sacred, they put it down there and let the bride jump over it, uh, hoping that it would encourage fertility within the bride in the United States and in England and in Ireland, all those states I told you about, and in Germany also. And then to show you how inconsistent they were, they used the same broomstick for the bride to jump over as a chastity test. <laughs> that, that tickled me. <laughs> if you're not all right, don't jump over that broom. <laughs> then the people in, the people in, in uh, Louisiana, those French people, they call them Cajuns, you know that come from up in Canada, he's come back him down in St. Lawrence, down that way. They live in, in bayous, way up in the country, up in, in, in Louisiana, in inaccessible places. If a white man, French family, if a man's a girl and boy wanted to get married, they did the same as my grandmother. And they, the girl jumped over the room, and her father merely signed a certificate saying, my daughter Marie was married to Pierre Lovergeon, uh, on this day, 1825, and when the priest came, they're all Catholics, see? when the priest came up there in those inaccessible places, priests didn't come but maybe once a year or twice at the most. So when the priest came, he would, uh, only he, thing he would do was confirm the marriage. It was, it was confirmed. He would confirm it in the Catholic Church as having been true and been good, you see. Then the Germans, some of you may be of German descent, the Germans, most of them settled in Missouri. The Germans in Missouri had a tradition. They jumped over the broom too. They jumped over it in Germany, in the country out in Germany. And then they brought that here, and they had another tradition. They would stand on, stand on the porch. A young man and his bride would stand on the porch, outside porch, you see, and he'd hold a broomstick in his hand, and his friends would get on the other side of the field at a given signal, shotgun or what, these men, young men, his friends, would run toward, the, bro pro toward the, the porch, and the first young man who grabbed the broomstick out of this man's hand would be the next couple to get married, would be the next one to get married. That's like throwing flowers to the, to the uh, girls, the, the bridegroom. Uh, here's another thing that they thought on the broomstick. If you're, if you're going home some dark night, some of you folks have lived on a farm, I'm sure, you're going home out in the country some dark night, you got a little stick, broomstick, knock things out of the road, pitch dark, you see. If you look behind you and find a ghost following you, naturally you run. So you're going, you run home. And it was thought that if you could get home 
before the ghost got a hold of you and run into the door and throw the broomstick across the seal of the front door. The ghost was too stupid to come on over and get you. He just run up and down on the outside of the broom club, you know, and you could sting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These are superstitions of the broom that I got from Chicago. Chicago. Here's the last thing I'll tell you. I found they sent me a little nursery rhyme just to show you how, how common it was in the United States. I, I'm sure that the master uh, of all my grandmother and all her friends, the master, when, when the black wanted to get married, boy or the, the girl especially, he had him to jump over the room because he didn't want to buy a truth over this girl. He'd say, y'all get mad, jump over this room and give him some cookies and, and lemonade, and that was it, you see. So that was his method for having the to do it, but it was a black custom. Now, the last thing is um, this, this nursery rhyme I got from, they sent me from Indiana. Listen to this. Anytime our, our custom is so so common that little children, four and five years old, play dollies with it, you know that's a common custom. This thing says, my dollies are going to be married. It's simple as simple can be. They merely jump over a stick and then they are married, you see. That's a nursery rhyme in Indiana. In Indiana. And then I found this to be, you know, integration. I kept working until I found one, a book where a black uh, couple was married as slaves, and there was a minister there, and he wanted to confirm it from a religious point of view. And he says this, I think this is a gem. I found it in a book on Hollywood Boulevard, secondhand store. And this says, dark and stormy may come to where I giants this he male and this she male together. Let none but him that makes the thunder Put this he male and this she male asunder. <laughs> I therefore announce you both the same. Go long, be good, keep up your name. The broom's been jumped, the world's not wide. She's now your own. Salute your bride. <laughs> oh. So now we do this little song. Great getting up morning. Here's another song that came up in the church. In the church, they had what they called a mourner's bench. They put the sinners down in the church, and the preacher preached to these sinners, trying to get them to come into the fellowship, those of us who were Christians, you see. And they didn't, then he would preach a, a sermon of hellfire and damnation. You either walk the straight and narrow path in those days, or to hell you went. Now we, we get all, make all kinds of getting around that, you know. But but not in those days you walk the straight and narrow path. So this man is trying to frighten the sinners to come to the church by telling them how gruesome it's going to be on the last judgment when, when the graves will be opening and the people coming up out of the graves and the stars falling and the lightning and the thundering and lightning going on. So they frighten the poor sinner. So I'm taking the preacher's part and this is your senses of... Now, you follow me now. I don't want any diddly dally. Tempo. I'm going to tell you about coming to the judgment. I'm going to tell you about coming to the judgment. There's a better day coming. There's a better day coming.
taking part because that's what I am, a song leader all over the world. When Brother Jesse said that the government sends me all over the world, that's what they had me doing. I wish you could have seen me one time in Dusseldorf, Germany, a rough place to try to get people to sing, and they are hard people to try to get to sing. I don't know any German, they don't know any English, and the, and the American government sent me out in a big park if those of you from Dusseldorf know that great big park there, they, they put me in that park and said, now, make the Germans sing. It was with me. <laughs> This was, uh, you know, we Lutherans in, in, in Germany have a holiday called Whit Sunday. Do, do you have that here? Oh, you don't have Whit Sunday? Lutherans? Whit Sunday? All over Europe they have it. Yeah, with Sunday, and then the next day is with Monday, of course, you see. <laughs> and so on with Monday in England, all all these places like that, all, all over Scandinavia, too, they have holiday on Monday. So this was with Monday, uh, and uh, in the, uh, after after Easter, you see. So they said, you go over and see. We want to have you, and we're going to have television to see if you can get a group of German people in an open park to sing. Nobody knows anything about blacks or cares anything, and they had me out there doing it. And I had a, a choir, I had, this was in 1963, and then when I was there in 61, I had all, already worked with a choir of six Germans in, in, uh, by Godesberg. I had four men and two women, and ladies and gentlemen, you never saw, those of you who are German descent, they are meticulous people. Those young people, they were in their uh, 20, about 20, 25 years old, so forth, and Lutz, Lutz Kramer or something was, was the head of them. They had bought every single record that any black church in the United States had, they had a, a, a part of records this high from the floor of Negro songs, gospel songs and things, and if you stand outside the door and they were in a room, you'd think they all came from Mississippi and were just black. I never heard such singing of gospel songs. So don't you ever tell anybody or none of your friends that only blacks can sing spiritual. You ought to have heard this thing and they call themselves the Dusseldorf gospel singers. <laughs> that was fun. And I worked, I worked with these Germans in 60, 61. So when the, the, the government said, we're going to send you to sing in 63 again back to Germany, I went back and they, they put me up there in Israel. So I got in touch with Lutz and his sextet. And we got out there in this park on with money. And I said, now, Lutz, there, there was the television all waiting to see what we were going to do. People walked. And in those days, the Germans had the big top hats on and spats, you know, and the cutaway coats and striped pants. And just walking with canes in the park. It was beautiful, like they do in Park Avenue on Easter Sunday. Well, they were walking like that. So <laughs> I said, Lutz, Let's start and sing a, a couple of good numbers and, and get them together, especially the kids. The kids will sing, and then their mothers and fathers will come around. So we, we started singing a couple of spirituals. Here comes some kids wondering, what is this going on? And we kept on. First thing you know, I had about 100 people around me. And it looks, this was, had a lot of personality. He got on this, uh, here, on this place and said to the German people that I was sent by the United States to uh, teach people Negro spirituals all over the world. And he said, 
say, you know, we Germans love to sing anything. They grow anything we'll sing. And so come on and help this man. So he was a, a con man. <laughs> we, we start singing. And so the kids jumped in. And first thing you know, so we sang, sang, sang. So we got to the, to the television. Wait until we get to Amen now before you turn the machine on. After a while, we sang about a half hour. And here comes Amen. I said, we're going to sing Amen. We had about a thousand people around us there. And I got up on this place, a big statue. I don't think it was Hitler or whoever it would have fallen on me. But, so it was, it was a statue of some other German, not Hitler. And so I said, we're all going to sing Amen. And I told him, I was singing Amen and everything. And all those Germans were singing Amen. And the television started. I said, go, man, let's go. And I had a prayer meeting right out there in the park. United States said, did you anywhere in the world? I want to go to Chester. And so there I am. I, I'm going to China one of these days after I knew it. So, so now here's the song we're going to sing. Gossip, Gossip. This is a little West Indian song that you can pick right up. This is a sermon in this song, too. It says, Gossip, Gossip, Evil Ting, T-I-N-G. Pronounce that now. Gossip, Gossip, Evil Ting. Yeah, all, all four of you said that now. <laughs> now, with the other three, please get in there and say, say, gossip, gossip, evil king. Now, come on, help these children. Here, here we go. Gossip, gossip, evil king. Much unhappiness. Now, don't say happiness. We're in the West Indian Islands now, see? We're all West Indians. Much unhappiness it bring. Much unhappiness it bring. If you can't, not can't now, can't is Mississippi. If you can't say something nice. If you can't say something nice. Don't talk at all is my advice. So you got a sermon, all you have to do is say amen and take up collection. You, <laughs> you got a sermon right there. See? So now listen. Who is this, Sue? Sue and I are going to give you some inspiration. I'll sing a couple courses with you when we get into this song. One, two, three, four. Gossip, gossip, even much fun. Ah! 
we're off to a good start now. We're about almost through. <laughs> now we sing. We, we got to here. We're going to sing our last number. Number is Amen. This, 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 you, this is the number that you know. Did we sing anything down to this? Yes. Uh, I have a song. This song in a, in a motion picture. There's a picture coming out in television. They, they, they did it for television. And it's... Uh, the name of the picture is Lily, Christmas Lilies of the Field. Do you remember 17 years? I didn't realize it was 17 years since, since I did. And with Sidney Poitier, was in a picture 17 years ago called Lilies of the Field. Do you remember the picture? And in that picture, Sidney, Sidney sang Amen. the song that we're going to sing. And he got it. 17 years ago. me up and said, just that we're doing another, another Lilies of the Field, and we need you, so I said, okay, and uh, this time, Billy Lee Williams is the star, very good looking old boy, you should see him, and the, uh, and the other thing, and this is a song saying, he was rich with some German now, and the uh, church, 17 years later, he's supposed to come through, I don't know what it's like, he got to see how he's checking along, he, the mother said, here he is now, seven, we should see him, Billy Lee Williams is taking his place. Christmas Lilies of the Field. Now, here's what I want you to do. This is our last song so that you can really uh, go out in a, in a good frame of mind. Most people start singing this thing, say, hey, amen, hey, amen. And then you see you're making a hole big enough to drive a truck through there. You must hold it and sustain it like this. Amen, amen. Then you make it a foundation for truth. You're the congregation, and I can preach, and, and we can all have a good religious time, you see. So be sure to get up before you say amen. Amen. That's nice, you see. Second, second place, many people start in clapping their hands. Amen. What? Yeah, they, they don't clap. I'll give you a signal when they clap. I have divided this song into little verses, little couplets, you see. And the first verse, for instance, says, Jesus. See a baby wrapped in the manger on Christmas morning. What is there to clap about? A little Jewish boy born in a nook, in a cave somewhere. So very few people knew anything about him. Okay, everybody was hunting rooms in this town that the Bible says. So nobody cared about Mary and Joseph. So there's no clapping. Twelve years old, see him in the temple, talking with the elders who marveled at his wisdom. A little twelve-year-old boy confounding a group of old philosophers in a Jewish synagogue, but no religion, you see, no clap, no religion, my clap. 30, 30, 30 years old, he starts, starts on, his, on his mission. See him in the Jordan, where John was baptizing and saving all sinners, baptized because of John the Baptist. Next one says, see him at the seaside, where he met Peter, Andrew, James, and John. See him at the seaside, talking to the fishermen, he said, men, follow me, and I said, men, Follow me. He's going on. He's saying, "Hold on, man. He's saying, 'We're gonna hold down the front of the hall in front of the man.' And same gang says, 'Crucify him. Crucify him on Friday. Crucify him.' He says, 'Live before him. Crucify him.' And to be a man trying to correct the good gracious these young people and enrich my life so that I can work on Christianity all the time. They have so much love. God bless them. And so that's that's what shouting for the risen Christ. The risen Christ. So then we all clap. We go out here. If you believe in it, if you don't have to clap anyhow. <laughs> so, so we sing amen. One more thing. My publisher asked me, oh, many years. 
years ago. He said, Jesse, you got to quit something. It's too monotonous. You're just singing, hey, man, you probably put it up something so we can sell more copies. And I went into my trance again, and I came out with this idea. Give me the key card, honey. Thank you. I said, hey, sing two verses, you see, in this key. Amen, 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 amen. I go by the fire and sing two more verses. Amen. And sing two more verses. Amen. And two more verses. And it's the biggest hit in this country. It's the <laughs> biggest religious hit in this country. Amen. Everybody sings it. Half the churches, everybody sings amen, you see. So now we go from key to key, modulation. You shut up till we get your key, and then you come on in here. You know? <laughs> no, you come on in with us. It'll be all right. <laughs> you can't kill this song. Come on. Thank you. 